To kick off Brown Blasts, we are delighted to feature internationally acclaimed speaker, author, and Brown professor, Tricia Rose. On defining racism. Racism is prejudice coupled with power. Anyone can be prejudiced against any group. I can dislike any group. I can have stereotypes for that group. The ability to use institutional, social, political, uh, cultural power to leverage my advantages significantly over the group that I have bias against, that's what racism is. And so you can't really have an anti-racist society until you come to terms with that kind of thinking about race and power and, and discrimination and the accrual over time of advantages based on race in a system of hierarchy with, with whites historically entirely at the top. On the white anti-racist. This is a really important part of the puzzle, which is figuring out um, what we need to do as individuals and as members of groups to change the way we understand racial hierarchy and the hidden ways that whiteness serves as a benefit, an asset, uh, and an invisible privilege. In order to undo that, the first thing that has to happen is a deep awareness of the institutionalized and social and cultural privileges that have been accruing to whites, no matter their personal belief system. They could be themselves tremendous activists and civil rights, you know, soldiers or, you know, that could be their own legacy. But the society has remained structured in such a way through a variety of policies and practices beneficial to whites uh, on, on in assets and also reduced risk. So as a recent study just came out that um, for the exact same crime, blacks are often sentenced 20% longer sentences. So there's just a 20% racial penalty, right? It's like the same crime. So when you look at both the accruing of assets and also the funneling of risk and danger to other groups, particularly blacks and other non-whites, coming to terms with that, being aware of it, paying attention to it, acknowledging it, is one of the very first ways that whites who want to be anti-racist um, need to begin to move. It, it isn't just about believing in equality in the abstract, because we find in the post-civil rights era that many whites don't think racism's a good thing and see personal bigotry as a real problem. But when you talk about structural racism or when you talk about institutional privileges, people get more uncomfortable and begin to feel threatened by the fact that they are being, in their mind, accused of having certain privileges. So we have to undo that feeling of accusation and deal with it as a fact, deal with it as a social formation, and think about how we can match the values of egalitarianism with an egalitarian context rather than a privileged racial context and a value of egalitarianism. We need to sort of examine whiteness and then avoid the kind of anxiety that often comes with the recognition of, of the various privileges that have been accrued. On racial privilege. To create an anti-racist society, we're really going to have to uh, untangle that history. And in that sense, we'd have to deal not just with racial privilege, but with the system of a racial taxonomy. Now, I offer that um, with you know, a little voice in the back of my head also saying that some people think that we now have reverse racism and that racial privilege is not something attached to whites but in fact can be, you know, accessed by any group, right? And that whites are at a disadvantage and studies show that many disgruntled, particularly working class whites, feel that they are at a disadvantage versus blacks and other people who have what they think are racial privileges. There's no data to support that. This is a sentiment around, in some cases, losing privileges, feeling like a disadvantage, as opposed to creating a level playing field. And then just the focus on racism itself begins to often produce this reverse racism thesis. On colorblindness. The idea of colorblindness it involves creating either laws, policies, practices, or behaviors that claim that race is of no significance or value, that it is blind to the color of any citizens who might be taking up such a policy or practice. So it's a system that says it doesn't see color, 
and it uses the neutrality of, of, of the absence of color as a way to presume that we have overcome a history of racial hierarchy. So for many, the notion of colorblindness was a kind of reasonable conclusion to Jim Crow. Jim Crow being the system, America's system of racial apartheid that was both segregation and racial hierarchy at the same time. So to say, well, if you had a system that marked people by color, 100% blacks or coloreds here with bad schools, you know, uncared for water fountains, can't sit at the counters, can't ride the buses, you know, has to sit in the back, all of the things that we know from our civil rights legacy, that in order to undo it, we're going to just end seeing color. Now, the principle of colorblindness is an ideal I think many of us might agree with, which is that we don't want to be judged based on color. But you can't have close to 400 years of a system of deep racial hierarchy and then decide on the next day at the end of you know, f those years that you're going to just imagine that you A, can't see color anymore and that the privileges that have been structured into society have disappeared. So to create a system in which you don't actually explicitly rely on color doesn't end the racial hierarchy that's in place. So colorblindness is one of these ideas that's very hard to argue with because people often feel like, what are you calling for? More racial groups and hierarchies in reverse and everybody gets nervous. But the question isn't, should we go colorblind? But what, sh what should we assign to the process of thinking about color and hierarchy? How can we undo the legacy and create a level playing field as much as possible? Because right now we still have a deeply unlevel playing field where whites still have tremendous advantages. And so colorblindness is one of these really emotionally complicated issues that in principle under the right circumstances should be a goal but you can't practice it ahead of the proper time because when you do you basically reinforce inequality. On the necessity of minority groups having their own spaces. This is a very hot button issue particularly on college campuses where you have a d tremendously diverse, at least at Brown we do, undergraduate populations coming from all kinds of different communities around the country and being in residence. So their whole lives are really here on the campus. And, you know, some people are concerned that groups for things like um, queer communities, LGBTQ communities, black and brown communities, Latinx communities, native communities, that these sort of what some are calling safe spaces, sort of community, sub-community spaces, are actually producing segregation and are causing less harmony in the community. But that point of view requires what I believe to be a misinterpretation of the experience of people of color on campuses in the first place, which is that for the most part they find themselves in facing lots of microaggressions and unintentionally often hostile contexts where their specific race, ethnic background is either being mocked in some way or disrespected or their talent and their capacity is subjected to stereotype threat. And you find that in order for those groups to actually manage the onslaught of, you know, lots of kinds of negative experiences, they need these little pockets of places where they don't have to be engaged in this kind of warfare. I mean, think of it in terms of women often, you know, a gendered analysis is often easier for people to think of. Imagine, you know, an all-male school with a tiny percentage of women in it and that there was a women's club. You'd think, gosh, we need at least one women's club, right? Because they have to handle male culture and the patriarchal expectations and assumptions and the lack of the value of women's intelligence makes sense. But that's basically what predominantly white institutions are. They're the racial equivalent of that kind of gendered example. And it doesn't mean, again, that the white students are hostile as a group and that they're racist. It, it doesn't really mean that. It means that we've all been raised in this soup that creates a set of blind spots and expectations and a capacity to reproduce these kinds of hierarchies and attitude and, and, and culture and that the young people of color find themselves 
really bearing the brunt of that system? The answer is obviously yes, I think we need these spaces, but even more important, we need to change the climate on many college campuses and use our formidable talents on the faculties to educate young people about how race works in our society um, and bring everyone to the table to, into that conversation the best way we can so that we actually change the climate, so that we have you know, clubs that might be for ethnic and racial and you know, cultural reasons, but that they are more affinity groups rather than safe spaces designed to create protection, right? Because that's what we don't want to normalize. But we have to confront it. Again, we're back to that thing. We have to we'll be willing to really examine it and look at it as a system-wide problem, not a one-off thing, not a one or two bad apples, but a climate that gets presented and, and, and um, reproduced you know, when we don't pay attention on anti-racist communities and what work we have ahead of us. In order to have an anti-racist community, there would have to be tremendous activity and a commitment across a wide range of institutions and groups. There are certainly groups of people, there are small, you know, cohorts of in institutions and groups that are working very hard, but they constitute a community across a very broad scope, right? They might be working in California and in New York and in Texas and in Detroit, but they wouldn't be physically all in the same place. So it's possible. Um, I don't think it completely exists, and it would take, you know, it would take some heroic and important effort. The work we have in front of us here is first not to imagine that time is going to take care of work we need to take care of ourselves. And the second thing is to see ourselves as on the same team that, you know, once we acknowledge the depths of this kind of serious structural discrimination, then we have a choice to make about what side of history we want to be on. It doesn't matter what place we came into this world. We couldn't control that. At some point, we have to take responsibility for how we're choosing to participate. And we have to see how, it, how our social structures create rewards and benefits for discriminatory action, and we have to reduce that. The Women's Leadership Council is deeply grateful to Professor Rose for sharing her time and insights. Do stay tuned for more great brown blasts in the future.